This is Mommying While Muslim, recorded live and unedited. Watch as Zeba and Uzma record their podcast. See their reactions and find out for yourself what all the buzz is about. Assalamualaikum, everyone. This is another episode of Mommy Well Muslim podcast with your co hosts, um, Zeba Hassan and Ozma Jafri. Zeba couldn't join us today, so filling in for her will be Sumaya Khan. Um, and she is not only our guest today for our Mom Powerment Month or Moms Outside of the Box Month, um, she is also going to be stepping in as my co host for the day. So, welcome, Sumaya. Assalamualaikum. Waikum Assalam. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so I guess I should have warned you ahead of time that you also have to be my co-host <laughs> for like the beginning of our episode today. So typically we want to find out about each other's weeks and how they've been going on. So tell us what your week has been like and what you've been up to. Um, well, I just arrived in uh, San Jose, California on Saturday. Um, so I've been here just over 24 hours and getting settled in with, um, at my mom's house and um, seeing my brothers and sisters and my nephews and nieces. So it's a nice change from, um, you know, being back home in Connecticut. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We're all having FOMO and a little bit jealous of you right now because we can't travel anywhere. And uh, like my mom, even though she lives locally, won't even hug me. She's like, yeah. just, you know, from far away, please. Like, I don't want to die. So that's kind of how we've been dealing with things. So but yeah, it would be nice to travel. <laughs> it's strange here because we have not hugged anybody either. And, really? I mean, we haven't seen each other since December. And um, yeah, we're all kind of keeping distance and staying in a separate room. Um, but the bigger concern is when I go back because California is pretty high on the list and Connecticut's mm -hmm. not so yeah and when you go later. back they're not like going to screen you at the airport you're leaving California for Connecticut or anything right did they do um, that they might they might because uh we have to quarantine when we get back for two weeks um, but it, that's California is you, on the list right um I'm not sure how they're monitoring it um I just know that the governor put a issue that people coming from certain states, California included, have to quarantine upon return or upon arrival. Uh -huh. So I'll have to figure that out. Um, maybe I can get tested and see if that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. solves it. I don't know. I mean, that sounds responsible and that sounds like a good way to manage um, intrastate infections or possibility yeah. for infections, transmission basically. And I don't know that all states are doing it, but if the Connecticut governor is, I don't know, is your governor a woman? No, uh, oh. he's not, but he's been on top of it and Connecticut's rates are really low right now. Like, I'm very glad to hear it. Very yeah. glad to hear it. So I hope you guys stay safe in California and enjoy your time with your family. Thank you. So my week has been about, as I told you, I just moved and I'm still unpacking boxes, removing stuff because it's hard to figure out what goes where. And so that's creating this constant state of overwhelm in addition to everything that's happening outside of our house, you know, in the world, as you talk, as, since we're talking about infections and school and all of that good stuff. So when I'm overwhelmed, I end up avoiding the actual task I have to do. Right. So I don't know if you have this problem, but stuff, I yes. saw a recent post on your Instagram where you're like, everybody posts pretty stuff, but I'm just going to post my dining room the way it is, you know? And so that's how my entire house looks. And honestly, your dining rooms looked so much better than my house does right now because everything is everywhere. Um, I just tumbled a whole bunch of books down off of my shelves because I didn't like the way they were arranged. So I, instead of rearranging them, have read five books this week. Oh. You know, because you find stuff on the shelf. I didn't know I had that. So let me read it. At least so, you're being productive. <laughs> yeah, basically. So that's kind of how my week has been. Avoiding the actual work at hand by doing the stuff that I love. So I think that's productive too. Yeah. Um, typically, I am <clears throat> doing a soapbox. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about, on my personal IG, I posted about it a little bit, alluding to um, what's happening in Portland. So 
Um, you're in San Jose. I don't know if people are talking about it, about what's happening to the protesters in Portland right now. Have you heard anything about that, Samaya? Um, I mean, I've, you know, been following on social media what's going on. And um, my brother actually is a, social, is a public defender here in San Jose and has been really active in the um, Black Lives movement here and also for uh, defunding local police here. So um, I, you know, just follow what he shares and he also has a podcast and things like that. So, um, but yeah, I did see what I've been watching just on online what's going on. Yeah, same here. Like Crazy. obviously watching online <clears throat> and trying to figure out what is going on in our country today. So basically for those of us who don't know or want to know a little bit more, there are black ops in Portland that are arresting basically unmarked officers in uniform. They look like they're in military grade uniform. They have no identification, no badge. So we don't know what agency they work for, but the feds have sent them in because remember, POTUS told um, the governor of Oregon that if you don't take care of, and the mayor of Portland itself, if y'all don't take care of these protesters, then I will. And by golly, he has. So he sent in these unmarked men, they're all men, um, in uniforms with like literally minivans. And they're grabbing protesters. Anybody who looks like they are Antifa, anybody who looks like they're leftist, whatever that looks like, dressed in black typically is how um, they're identifying people who aren't even engaged in rioting work or anything. They're peaceful protesters who are being zip tied behind their backs and thrown into these minivans and we don't know what's happening to them. Um, we think that these uh, unidentified federal officers are Blackwater. Blackwater has since changed its name, maybe in response to the Black Lives Movement. I'm not sure. Um, I forget what they're calling themselves now. But what that is, is basically mercenaries that are government hired to go destabilize governments overseas or to, you know, massacre lots of civilians like they have done in many other countries, including Iraq. You can look up what Blackwater has done before. Um, in the meantime, um, while we have this police state action happening in what we thought was a free democratic nation, We've had civil rights leaders die left and right. We've had Linda Sarsour um, arrested this week for protesting outside of the house of the Kentucky Attorney General who refuses to arrest the officers who killed Breonna Taylor. Um, we're now finding out that she was actually alive after they shot her and tried to figure out how to cover their you know what. So um, the cameras were at least able to pick up that audio. So basically, the direction of this nation is headed in a very, very dark red place. And we need to fix that with the yellow envelopes that we've all received. So participate in your primary elections, y'all, and make sure that you're registered. If you are naturalized, this is where you're gonna earn that blue passport, y'all, and you're going to get to the polls in November because these are not the actions of a free democratic nation of the people, by the people, for the people. We don't have federal agents storming our states, the same party that says, oh, states should decide how we should school and blah, blah, blah. But no, when it comes to protesting, we're gonna swoop in and disappear your protesters. Um, it is not okay. It is unfortunately legal right now because we have no precedent historical precedent of this happening in our nation. So I urge everybody to get active, to get informed and go ahead and visit my IG so you can see what I think about uh, police and um, militarization of our government. That's my soapbox for today. Any questions or comments? No, I think you got it covered. <laughs> okay, awesome, awesome. So um, as I said before, we're talking to moms outside the box. And the reason we asked you, Samaya, to join us today, because you have this unique, powerful, really important work that you're doing, but also this very personal story of heartbreak and resilience that I heard about first. And then, meaning, I mean, I, I, I kind of tapped in for that. And then I realized, you know, what you're doing professionally and was like so in love with it because it's a project, to be honest, that locally we've tried to start and have fallen on our face. You know, it's just not, it's so hard to do. So I really, really appreciate that. And I would love to talk about it. 
Um, as Samaya told us earlier, she was born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area. She's a registered dietitian who lives in New Haven, Connecticut, and she is co-founder and program manager of Sanctuary Kitchen, which partners refugee and immigrant chefs um, to build economic opportunity and authentic connections through food one of our favorite things next to FTP. Um, it started as her passion project, Sanctuary Kitchen, um, brings together her upbringing, her work in social justice, her passion for food and nutrition. If you haven't checked out her food, uh, the pictures are, I mean, I watched those pictures during Ramadan. I was in a lot of trouble that whole month because those pictures just do salivate. She's a mother of two. And despite all these, or maybe, she was able to do all of these amazing things because of it. I'm not sure, we're gonna find out today. Sumeya is um, a warrior. She lost her husband when he was just 42 years old. They'd been married for 18 years and she's gonna tell us about that as well today. So, Salaikum again. Thank you so much for joining us, Sumeya. Thank you for having me. And um, yeah, I hope um, I can convey my experience um, so that's beneficial to those who are listening. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's why you're here. And we know that there's got to be some people out there who are going to be inspired for sure by you. But why don't we start, like we always start um, asking our guests to tell us a little bit about their mom story. Um, yeah. So like you said, I have um, two children. I have a 14 year old son and an almost 11 year old daughter. Um, I um, work full time um, at you know, I worked full time as a registered dietitian before I had kids, and um, and then after my son was born, I, I switched to kind of per diem and consulting um, and increasing my hours as I as they got older. Um, but primarily, I, I stayed home with them until they were in school. Um, and um, in 2017, um, I joined a group of amazing women in New Haven to launch a sanctuary kitchen um, that, as you mentioned before, it was, it was something I was interested in and I um, was kind of doing on the side as, as something I, I was passionate about and I'm still working part-time elsewhere. Um, but it really took off and um, it became a full-time job in 2018. Right, right. Um, before we talk more about sanctuary kitchen, can we go ahead and backtrack and talk about other? as much as you're comfortable talking about it. Yeah. Um, so um, Arthur and I actually met when I was in, in high school. <laughs> and wow. um, yeah, and um, you know how Muslim communities are, there's always like, it's like two degrees of separation, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, we had a lot of mutual friends. Um, I was looking at colleges um, in California and, um, and, I had seen him around at like Muslim conferences and um, he was in Southern California. I was up here in North and um, uh, when I was touring colleges, uh, we actually bumped into him and um, you know how it is when you're, you, you have like a Muslim radar, right? <laughs> when you see people, you're like, oh, I've, <laughs> yeah. Ding, 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 ding. yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, he was already, um, I think he was a junior at that time at UCLA. And um, anyways, he ended up giving my dad and I a tour of like the MSA office and um, he was editor of Altalib News Magazine. Uh, this was back in 1995, <laughs> so it's been a while. Mm -hmm. um, anyhow, when you know, I got into college and I saw a different college, I didn't go to UCLA. Um, we were both really involved with our MSAs and got to know each other um, through various like projects and events. Um, and um, we ended up uh, getting married um, my junior year in college. And, and um, yeah, and, you know, continued our new life together through grad school. And we moved to Seattle, Washington, and then um, and moved out to New Haven in 2003 to finish his, um, edu his postdoc stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, we just, you know, set up, we had actually only planned to be in New Haven for a year. Um, and then it, his, uh, he ended up getting this postdoc and that became a job. And then we ended up settling um, in New Haven. So, I mean, Hamala, we had a really, um, 
you know, a really blessed life. We had, you know, two beautiful kids and, you know, he was doing really well in his career. Um, I was just getting back into mine. Um, <clears throat> and he was, um, he studied naturopathic medicine. So he was a naturopathic physician. And then he also was a research scientist at, for integrative medicine at Yale. Um, and in 2017, um, he was diagnosed with, like they called it cancer of unknown origin because they couldn't quite figure out what kind of cancer he had. It was really strange. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really just knocked us because, you know, alhamdulillah, he had been at that point, like in his best shape physically, he was doing really well professionally. Um, but we knew something wasn't right. He just wasn't feeling well. He was just really tired and um, the doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong. And they run like, ran all kinds of tests, tried different medications um, for a cough, <laughs> really, that's what it was. Mm. Um, and then by accident, um, they found um, enlarged lymph nodes in his abdomen, and um, but still no tumor. So that's why they just couldn't exactly figure out what kind of cancer it was, but they had sus what they suspected and they started treatment right away. Um, he actually we used to see patients at, at the Yale Cancer Center here, Smilo, um, doing integrative medicine. So he was very familiar with, with the environment. And thankfully, he had great colleagues who really supported him and just like really immediately um, formed a great treatment plan um, that he actually responded to um, very well initially. Um, he started feeling better. He was working. And... Um, and we were all very optimistic about this is something that we're going to get through and it'll be fine. Um, and just near the after, I think it was like 10 weeks of it, um, you know, they were just wrapping up his chemo and talking about next steps. And um, he started to feel worse again, um, having difficulty swallowing. Um, it was just right around his brother time of his brother's wedding. We had come out here to L.A. for that. Um, and so when we got back, um, you know, they did some more tests to see what was happening. And that's when they actually found the tumor in his esophagus. And things just kind of went downhill after that. Um, his treatment changed, his medical team changed, um, and the prognosis was very, very poor. Um, you know, he was being considered for experimental things, but his just health just declined significantly. and. Um, you know, that last month was like in and out of hospitals and, um, and um, finally, I think finally the doctors kind of said like, you know, like maybe two months. And it was strange because, you know, the doctors were, a lot of them were his colleagues and I think they weren't ready to admit that. And so, I th and I purposely didn't like Google his diagnosis because I didn't want to go down that path and um, so we were kind of all in denial about it um, but um, at that point I still remember it was like a Monday when the doctors kind of talked to us about like the reality of what we were facing um, and then at that point we were just like okay it's time to like get family to come um, we actually only ended up having three days and um, we were with him that morning and sorry. Um, his brother was able to come and uh, my sister-in-law and um, his parents were actually supposed to fly in that evening, but they didn't make it. Um, but we were surrounded by his friends and his colleagues and um, yeah, alhamdulillah, he just, had, he, we all got to say goodbye and, you know, um, but yeah, it just left us reeling because we just weren't ready, you know, so. Yeah, I can't even imagine, you know, like three days. That's. Yeah, I mean, we had nothing in place. We, mm -hmm. we just literally had talked to a lawyer the day before about doing a will and right. um, 
but you know, really our, um, our local community really stepped up and like took care of what needed to be done. And um, um, that night we were on a plane to California for uh, his Janaza and um, which happened the next day. Yeah. Um, actually yeah. it happened, yeah, like a day and a half later. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it is what it is, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I see like your Instagram is kind of a way for you to write and cook almost an homage to him. Is that part of how you heal? Um, <clears throat> I used to cook a lot, um, you know, being in the food world and um, I actually prefer to bake <laughs> more than cook. Oh, okay. um, but, um, you know, I was always a, I'm a recipe follower and I'm always like, I was like, you know, search recipes and try new things. And, you know, Arthur was my, my tasting person. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, we were both, you know, foodie, their kids are, um, they'll have a really wide palate. Um, so yeah, I used to cook, um, cook for him really, um, mm -hmm. because he enjoyed it and, we love trying new foods and um, Arthur also used to, he enjoyed cooking as well. And, um, and so afterwards it was really hard to, well, one, I just was not in the mindset <laughs> to cook and thankfully, you know, I had friends and family bringing food um, and even during his treatment. But, um, you know, it's like that motivation is gone, right? Like. Yes, I love my kids, but they're, you know, and they love good food, but they're also fine with mac and cheese from a box, you know, so, yeah. um, so there just wasn't that motivation to like make these elaborate meals and experiment and bake and all of that um, for a long time. And you'll see in my Instagram, there was like, there's kind of a big gap mm -hmm. um, in my postings. Um, and probably like the, maybe last year, um, was maybe where I was, you know, just getting back on my feet and trying to do a little bit more of that. Um, you know, that first year I just let everything go myself, sure. um, my, the house, you know, my job, you know, well, not so much my job, but, you know, um, but last year I turned 40 and um, I was like, I cannot enter my 40s in such an unhealthy way. Like I, you know, I was mentally, physically just not in good shape. And um, I made a concerted effort to like do something about it. Um, I just was tired of feeling so bad. And so um, I hired a personal trainer uh, to get back into shape. Um, you know, started eating better again and, you know, put in check that emotional eating that I was doing at night <laughs> um, and trying to cook again um, the little bit I could with the time, the little time that I had. Um, and that was really hard because, you know, in my mind, I was, I would cook these meals and wait for feedback from, from Arthur and he wasn't there to receive it. So like, I think I mentioned in one of my posts, like I'm making these things, but I don't um, like, there is no recipient for that love, you know? Um, so it's still, you know, something I'm working on. Um, when I have time, it does, um, it getting to the point where I can like make, a nice meal and or bake something doesn't come often just because it's so busy um, but when I do it, it feels good yeah and I mean it looks amazing when you do do it so you know I love that when we asked you earlier like how did you heal you know your cooking baking all of that is you know it's coming back to you it's it's been a means for your healing. But what I thought was really interesting was that, you know, your faith was not something that kind of carried you through this very rough, because it's only been two years, right? 
It'll be three in October. Three in October. So, you know, it's, it's been a short time, but can you talk about kind of the role of your faith in your grief process? Like, what did that look like? How did that feel? Yeah. Um, you know, this was the first time that um, I understood why people lose their faith. Um, I'm a lot like I've had a very strong upbringing and, you know, as a Muslim, um, with my family and my community that I grew up with. Um, I lost my father when I was 20. Um, we've had other, um, you know, like everybody, ha- life-changing situations, um, difficulties, challenges. Um, but I, my faith was never jeopardized during those. Um, in fact, they were what got me through those mm-hmm. situations, those difficulties, right? Um, but this was, you know, it shook me, um, in in a way that I never experienced before. And, um, yeah, and I just, I couldn't find the solace that I needed through it. Um, because, I mean, we have, um, you know, we have in our Dean, like, um, you know, an explanation, right, of why these things kind of happen, like, um, and, you know, people would share them with me, like, oh, this is, you know, it's a test, um, you know, Allah loves him and wants him to be near him, um, you know, um, he's a, sh- you know, because of the way he died, he's a shaheed, you know, these are, like, things that are meant to help comfort uh, yeah. rationalize and comfort right yeah um but <clears throat> you know and you know and even after like in his some of his darker moments he also questioned like why me you know he was such a beautiful person just you know really sincere practicing um very so generous um and throughout his illness like his his theme i guess was like gratitude um and you know things that he would impart to the kids were always about gratitude and just the way he experienced life was through gratitude um so it was like yeah why you know um and I tried, you know, talking to some of my, you know, my Muslim teachers that I had, um, who have always, you know, guided me um, through my life. And, um, you know, they also struggled <laughs> understanding, you know. This particular the, situation? Yeah, I mean, basically saying like, you know, we don't, we don't understand the wisdom um, in, in things like this happening, and, um, and maybe we will later. Um, and yeah, I you know I still. It's you know I like I understand, you know this could be a test for me, right? And how I respond and how I react and how I act, but. Um, I don't understand how it's a test for my children, you know, because they're not accountable. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, my son, I mean, my kids are just now entering puberty, but when this happened, you know, they were much younger. So it's, um, yeah, just trying to understand all of that. Like, what does that mean for them? Like, Mm -hmm. um, why do they need to be tested this way? and, you know, I see the, you know, things that my siblings went through when they were, my younger siblings were similar ages when my father passed away. And, um, you know, we all reacted differently and handled it differently. And so looking back at their experiences, I, again, question, like, where's, where's the wisdom? Um, but, you know, one thing I did maintain, despite 
wanting to just like bury my head was, you know, I still like kept up my prayers, you know, reading Quran, um, hoping that there'll be an opening in that process. Okay. I mean, I, I, again, I have no frame of reference for this. I can think of the valleys because I feel like grief has, you know, hills and valleys. Faith has hills and valleys. We have those times when it's really high, but, you know, at my lowest points, which was, you know, when I got depressed, it was not the kind of loss that you experienced at all. And in that time, I gave up my prayer because not because I lost faith in Allah, but it was just, I think I was so depressed. It was handicapped. I was handicapped. Like even making wudu was like too much of a physical effort for me to get spiritually engaged. So, I mean, I, I don't even know what that's like, but I can, I guess I want to know because you're from California, which has such a vibrant uh, community and so much Muslim engagement. Were there any resources that helped heal you or try to bring you back besides your shiuch or your teachers that you reached out to? Um, there isn't any, um, you know, formal support systems that I know of um, for situations like this uh, anywhere in the country. Um, and that was it. That's a been a challenge for sure because, um, you know, at the recommendation of, of friends and, um, you know, I started seeing a therapist, um, like this a few months after, maybe like in the spring after, um, and, you know, and she was great. Um, but what I found is she lacked the, um, the religious context, right? The right. spiritual context. Um, and also the cultural context, right? Because um, there are things that, you know, I come from an indo Pakistani background, you know, like things that, and just being from an Asian family, you know, like things that families do and interactions and lack of boundaries and, and so forth that happen. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was definitely that disconnect. So like when I was questioning my faith, like that was not something that she could really address, right? Um, and um, we, I, I took my kids to like a family support group um, that was um, helpful, I think, to my daughter, but not my son. Um, and, you know, we tried kind of like the different like conventional things that were available just in general, not just, you know, I think faith-based. Um, and so, um, but what really, I guess, helped me the most was talking to one of my dearest friends who um, had experienced the same type of loss the year before me. Mm. Um, and, you know, she was one of my best friends growing up here in the Bay Area. And, um, and you know, she was the one that my sounding board, my, you know, person that we could commiserate together because we both knew exactly what each other were going through mm -hmm. um and so even though i was on the east coast and she was here on the west coast like you know we really um she really supported me more than anything um i also joined this like it, at that time it was a facebook group it was for um young widows um that both of us actually me and my friend joined together and that was interesting um because in some ways, again, it was people who had gone through the same thing as us, um, but still there was that lack of um, faith and, and spirituality. Because I mean, I mean, they talked about you know coping with kids and you know first anniversaries and all of all of the loneliness and um, everything that comes with grief. Um, but then there was also like you know when do you start dating again? <laughs> you yeah. know, things like that. That are like, okay, like that's where, can't relate. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so my friend Amina and I actually um, have been talking about what, now that we're like a few years out, um, you know, about, you know, trying to start something for Muslim widows and widowers. Um, 
you know, some type of support group. Um, and COVID happened, <laughs> so that, that kind of put things on hold, but um, it's definitely something that we're exploring. Yeah, no, my encouragement to you would be please do it, you know, because you've walked those steps, like you know that path already, and you know what's not existing, because the refrain I'm hearing as you're talking about it is, you had this one friend, you had all the mainstream resources, but nothing Islamic uh, based which maybe could have helped you during your your spiritual anguish as well right. um, and if you can be the person that helps consolidate those resources and bring them to other muslim widows and widowers i know that you're not the only one going through this but you know i love that you're thinking about these others that that probably need you and need these resources that you're talking about so yeah I absolutely, absolutely love that. yeah i love it and, and, you know, we don't have the answers no, for no. a lot of things. We're figuring it out as we go. Mm-hmm. Um, but the fact that, um, you know, there are other people who are struggling just like us makes, it just feels less alone. And, you know, you can sound off ideas and ways and invent also. Right, um, right, yeah. Yeah. Well, we talked a little bit about how you had to deal with your grief. Um, sort of touched on the kids, but, you know, as moms, we want to know how the kids are doing in the last couple of years, like, you know, how they've coped now before when other first passed and now. Yeah, it's been um, definitely valleys and peaks with my children and they're both so different um, and they've needed different things at different times. Um, And you know, initially, um, you know, my daughter really struggled. Um, and then, you know, that first year, I mean, it was just, it was just messy. (laughs) Um, my son was starting middle school at the same time. Um, and so that came with a lot of changes already. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, we, you know, we're doing the family support group kind of Actually, that didn't even start till like almost a year later. Um, that first year was just, you know, just kind of keeping our head up. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but we were very lucky. We have a very small uh, kind of tight-knit community in New Haven. It's a small town and everybody kind of knows everybody. And um, the kids go to a private school that they've been at since kindergarten. And so really like the school and our community really rallied around them and uh, and me and um, just kind of went above and beyond to really help us get us through it and um, the kids um, yeah they just you know initially they were really fragile and you know <clears throat> they did they you know went through the school year and um, but it wasn't until um, when school ended for my son um, that first summer um he literally just slept for like two weeks and and that's when it hit me like he had been holding it together until school ended and then just like let go and he got sick and um and he's somebody who like rarely gets sick and if he does like he bounces back really quick um and so that summer I just like didn't do anything like in terms of um structured activities and camps and things like that like they did a few here and there but I just let him like relax and veg and he loves video games and that was kind of like his what he went towards um and um yeah like those last couple months for him he really struggled with school and like um you know academically and um it just it's it kind of started hitting him near the end of the school year um and and he definitely showed signs of like depression and um, anger um about the situation so um i found him a great therapist that summer um that he ended up seeing and it made it really helped him kind of identify those feelings and ways to manage it and um, balancing out school and you know, and all of that. Um, 
so when he started the school year the following year, he, um, you know, went in a lot stronger. Uh, my daughter, on the other hand, by then, she seemed to be fine. Like, oh. the way she was handling things emotionally and, um, you know, she was doing okay. Um, when COVID hit, though, and we were social, we were um, isolating, self-isolating at home, those couple weeks, um, she started showing signs of grief again. Oh. Yeah, and... Um, I mean, I, I was feeling it too. And, and even like the language people are using um, about what, what people are feeling in terms of like being socially isolated and not seeing people for, you know, weeks on end or like they were using languages of grief. Right. Um, and then, um, you know, school went online and she, you know, school was not going to resume in person for the rest of the school year. And that really, really hit her hard and she really had a hard time. Um, with that and um, she um, I had her start seeing um, a therapist um, online which wasn't ideal and she didn't love it Um, but I just wanted like I just was struggling on how to help her um, as well and um, we were both really stressed out and um, and tired and trying to do it all and um we would just end up arguing and it wasn't helpful for either of us so I was just like you know let's bring in somebody else to help you and the fact is like they're both going through puberty and you know there's hormones and emotions and body changes and all of that happening at the same time so it's really hard to know like (laughs) what's grief and what's normal development right 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 right. so it's um but you know they um they say you know kids are resilient and it's true you know i see things that they do and um they'll surprise me on sometimes with their maturity on how they react to things um and you know sometimes i feel like you know i'm failing i mean a lot of the times i feel like i'm failing them and i'm like a horrible parent and you know, I know that's, I'm not alone in that. No, <laughs> you're definitely not alone in that. Um, and I'm like, oh God, I'm like scarring and screwing my kids up for life. Um, and then other times I'm like, okay, maybe they'll be okay. You know, it's, it's definitely up and down. Have your, um, your younger siblings who lost y'all's dad younger, have they been able to kind of make a connection with your kids and walk them through this process a little bit? I know COVID is like, out of left field and nobody can, you know, talk about that, but, you know, just on yeah. commiserating about we lost our father. Yeah. And, um, they, yeah, I mean, my siblings have been very like, um, in tune with that for sure. And, um, and I've reminded my kids that like, that they're there as an outlet as somebody yeah. to talk to, um, that um you know they're they have four uncles <laughs> right. um and who are very active in their lives and they're very close to in you know in different capacities despite the distance um so um they definitely hang out and you know facetime and socialize that way and then when we get to, when we're able to get together um they, you know, they love it. And that was like primary, my reason for coming and risking coming into California was because they just needed to be around their cousins and their uncles and aunts, um, you know, this summer because it's been so hard. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they don't talk about it, you know, it's, I think, um, you know, they don't talk about grief necessarily, or they don't necessarily like, like rarely will they even say I miss they used to call other Bobby miss Bobby unless I like tease it out of them um they're not really um yeah they're not really like able to like put words to necessarily what they're feeling sometimes um which I you know even grown-ups have that oh, difficulty yeah. yeah um do you think but they manifest it 
Um, maybe, um, but I always, I made a point of if I was struggling or if I was feeling sad, like I would tell them and let them know that this is how I'm feeling. Um, and it's okay, you know, um, you know, to miss other, to miss the life that we used to have. Um, you know, it's okay to be angry. Um, and so I've been purposeful in like sharing my feelings so that they understand that it's okay um, to fall apart. It's okay to not be happy um, and, um, you know, to be sad, to be angry and all, you know, the range of feelings. Um, and I was very, also very careful about um, having, especially my son, to be exposed to people who say things like, oh, you're the man of the house now, or you need to take care of your mom, um, things like that, which I really try to shield them as much as possible. I'm sure they got it from people, yeah. but like as much as possible, I really like tried to protect them from hearing those things because that's no burden that any child should have to, to carry. Mm -hmm. So it kind of, that's a good segue to what are the stupidest things that people have said to you? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, or to your there's, kids. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's a lot of cliches, obviously, like, you know, everything happens for a reason. Um, he's in a better place. Um, the biggest thing, of course, is like, oh, you're so strong to me, you know, telling me, and, um, you know, I just want to tell them, like, yeah, I might be, but I really don't have a choice either, you know what I mean, like, I have children to take care of and raise, I have a job, like, I can't just necessarily fall apart and let, you know, I'm not just responsible for myself, right, um, and then there's that, you know, saying, like, um, what is it, like, just because you carry it well doesn't mean it's not heavy, right, and, right. And um, that's very, you know, like really sums it up. Right. Um, and then, you know, the biggest thing was um, because now I'm in Connecticut alone um, in terms of like, I mean, I have my friends in my community, but I don't have any family members in, in Connecticut with me. Um, so the biggest question is like, oh, you know, are you... Um, Sorry, my daughter just walked in. Oh, no worries. <laughs> my kids, I don't know if you can hear them thundering upstairs. Like, I feel like my ceiling's going to fall down. Yeah, no, just write that. They have this radar, right? When you're talking <laughs> about something, you don't want them to hear. Yeah. Um, yeah, so when are you going to move back to California? Or is your mom going to move in with you? Mm. Um, and, and they would say it in front of my kids. Like, and I was just like, what? Are you crazy? You know, like, they just had their whole world fall apart and shifted and now you're talking about moving across the country to yeah a place they visited but they their only home that they know is is in new haven mm -hmm. and their school and their friends and their teachers and you know all of that um so that was um that's always been really frustrated frustrating yeah. um and so not really understanding like a, a change like a move is just not necessarily healthy for any you know right away um or helpful um you know there's issues of um sometimes being treated like a, a kid again by family members um mm -hmm. even though you're a grown adult who has yeah. children of their own mm -hmm. and who's been pretty independent <laughs> um so you know parenting advice to like i mean it, obviously it comes out of love um, right. and care and concern but you know, that like, um, assuming kind of like that you need to be told how to do things again. Mm -hmm. um, because maybe you must be so fragile. Let us do this job for you. Yeah. Of, and yeah. I mean, there's a difference between like support and helping, which, you know, of course I welcomed and really appreciated, um, but like kind of being told what to do or not to do. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it ranges. I mean, my mom, um, because she went through it herself, um, you know, was, um, 
you know, she, you know, kind of gave me some space in that sense. Um, we, you know, we have a different, a very unique relationship um, and we do things very differently. So, um, um, that was, you know, a challenge in itself, but yeah. And then our, or the focus from, you know, something that my friend expressed was um, my, my friend who also went through this was uh, she sometimes felt invisible because the focus from family or from in-laws were on her as a caregiver mm -hmm. of the grandchildren. Right. Um, and like making sure that their needs were met and how are they coping, but not really recognizing that, you know, the mother is experiencing grief herself and needs help coping as well mm -hmm. um, emotionally. Um, so that definitely comes up. Um, and then I guess the biggest pet peeve um, is um, when friends complain about their husbands. Um, you know, and I mean, it, it, I mean, with the caveat, like there are some friends I know I would tolerate that from because we're really close and they've been there for me and they know my contacts and like, um, they're not being insensitive, mm -hmm. um, but there's others who are being super insensitive and, you know, complaining about their husbands or about, you know, their husbands not helping or not being around or being busy or whatever. And, you know, it's like, really, <laughs> you're going to tell that to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like, um, it's just like, yeah, you know, I would, I would do anything to have a day of having to complain about my husband. You know what I mean? Like, um, I would, you know, to get that back. Um, or I had some, or the, I mean, alhamdulillah, like, you know, we had a good marriage, a very happy marriage. You know, of course we had our challenges like any couple and, you know, we worked at it. Um, it wasn't like this like fairy tale marriage, yeah. but like, you know, we worked hard um, and, um, but alhamdulillah, we, you know, we had a good marriage. And so I have gotten that where like, at least, you know, you had a good marriage with your husband, even though it was short, like comparing it to themselves, like being a, kind of stuck in an unhappy relationship. Is that okay to say though? No. Doesn't that, yeah, I was going to say, I was like, I don't think that's okay. Wait a minute. I thought that's still an inappropriate thing to say. Yeah. It's like, as if that gives permission for yeah something like this happening. Absolutely. You know, like. So I have to tell you, like this whole week, anytime my husband annoyed me and yesterday was like icing on the cake annoyed me. And it was actually pretty egregious what happened. But when I went down that dark path that we go, I thought of you. And I mean, we don't really know each other from Eve, except I've, I'm like your Instagram stalker, right? <laughs> um, but you know, it's such an example to me, just based on the stories that you've told about us there and your family and your grief process that, you know, I'm realizing, like, as you said, your husband lived a life of gratitude and it's making me more thankful for, okay, you know, in the grand scheme of things, is this going to matter? Am I even going to remember this in 40 years? I probably won't. Okay. And inshallah, I hope that he's still around in 40 years for me to pick fights with him or, you know, whatever it is. I hope not. But, you know, it's just, I want you to know that even not knowing us out there in the virtual world and the social media world, you're changing our lives and you're making them better. And I think you're making me better. Um, so I really appreciate that. And I want to say, thank you so much for, you know, modeling that beautiful, being that beautiful model for us you know, to be more thankful, live a gracious and, and mindful life. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, I wasn't careful about the things I would say. So I'm like, everything that all these notes are really, really helpful, because these are the things that you don't see in the future to somebody who's grieving. Because right now, unfortunately, we know a lot of people who have passed from COVID. So I just don't want to say the wrong thing to people. So 
Um, yeah, it's just about, is. yeah, it's just about listening and being there really. Um, and not making it about yourself. Right. Right. And silence is always okay. Yeah. 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 Silence Most of the time cool. we just need a sounding board, you know, or just know that somebody's in their corner mm-hmm. um, and, and not necessarily waiting for help to be asked or, um, mm-hmm. you know, just jumping in. Cause most of the time you're like, I don't know what I need in the middle of that. You don't know what you need. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> you're just, you know, trying to like get out of bed. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, and I, and I know, I know I do it all the time. Like, Oh, let me know what I can do to help, you know? Um, and we just need to remind ourselves to just do it, like do whatever you think you would need at that moment and just do it. Yeah. When, in my experience, when people have had loss and in my experience, when I've had loss, it's food. That's been the language of love. The meal trains come out. Like I remember when my daughter was hospitalized for a couple of months, I never cooked. Our masjid family did all the cooking. They brought all the food. I still had Tupperware from that time period. (laughs) I don't know who it belongs to because people were feeding my family. They weren't asking. They set it up. They brought it over. I never had to worry about anything except what was right in front of me, like that health issue. And I always appreciated that. And that became my action, you know? So my fear is that this person isn't going to tell me what they need, because like you said, maybe they don't know what they need at this moment. So it's just, I will drop off dinner this day, or I will deliver dinner this day. And I try not to make it sound as I'm telling you what's going to happen because I've taken away even more choice and agency away from them. Um, But I, you know, if they're saying no, obviously I'll pull back. Um, And usually it's because six other people are delivering food that day. Can you do it a different one? Um, but in that, in the spirit of that food is love context, can you start telling us about Sanctuary Kitchen and how that may or may not have helped you in your grieving process as well? But we want to talk about where that came from and how other was involved in it too. Right, right. Yeah. Um, you know, the year before, you know, I've been talking to folks like partners in, in New Haven about charting something like this and, um, you know, it was just something that I was interested in doing on as a side. And um, just when I grew up in the Bay Area, like my family was very active in the community and um, we had a lot of different refugee um, families come through and get resettled in, in California. And um, my family was really involved in, in helping that process. And um, so I was kind of seeing similar things happening in New Haven as being a sanctuary city and a resettlement city. Um, and also just with the food scene. Um, and so, um, you know, Arthur, you know, mashallah, he, like he was just, you know, he was my biggest cheerleader when it came to things I was interested in, think my work, um, you know, whatever skills I had. And, um, and the launch of Sanctuary Kitchen and his illness, like, were within a month of each other. Mm. Um, and that was really stressful because, you know, we were just like getting the program off the ground. And and then now, like I was also like managing, um, you know, his treatment and, and so forth. And, um, you know, I, you know, I used to joke with him. I was like, Oh, your, your timing is impeccable. Right. Like, just when I'm <laughs> getting started with this, like you have to get yeah. sick, like what's, yeah. Yeah, what's going on here. But, you know, even from his bedside at like when he was getting chemo, like, you know, his colleagues would come and visit and he'd start talking about Sanctuary Kitchen with them as a way to like get them like supportive, uh, get their support and so forth. And um, he was really, you know, proud of what um, we were able to put together and accomplish. Um, obviously, you know, he, he, it was it was a stressful time um, trying to manage it both and um, you know, I'd be sitting next to him while he's getting chemo and on my laptop and, you know, <laughs> doing stuff and planning events. Um, after he passed, I took some time, obviously, to, you know, I took time off from that. And, um, and um, it, by then, it was, when I was ready to come back, it was almost a year in and um, the position was going to go full time. 
um, and it, it needed it. And, um, and I took it, you know, I went from part-time to full-time and this was the full t- first time I was working full-time since I had kids. So in hindsight, it was probably not the best time to do that. Um, it ended up being really stressful uh, for me to like manage now working full time, uh, childcare, um, you know, doing everything by myself, right? Like at home with the kids. Nice. Um, but at the same time, it was um, it was necessary because of just the nature of the work and, and how the program was growing. It had to be full time. Right. Um, and you know, we're a small group and like, it's not something that I could have just like outsourced necessarily either. I find somebody else to help, you know, pair up with. Um, but ultimately it became my lifeline as well. You know, um, the work that we were doing and we are doing is just, um, it's so impactful. Um, the woman, the refugee woman I work with, um, you know, they're such an inspiration, uh, resilient, and, you know, just, they are resilience, you know, they've, Mm -hmm. most of them, all of them, um, have experienced horrible situations, um, extreme trauma in their back homes, you know, they've literally had to, like, drop everything and leave what they love the most, um, and come to a new place and start up again and start all over, not knowing the language, not knowing the com- customs and the culture and, um, and you know, just trying to like make ends meet. Um, but they do it with a smile and they still are so, so generous. Um, and really, you know, the women I work with, both um, the team and, and the chefs, like, you know, they became, you know, my family and really, you know, they really put things in perspective for me. You know what I mean? Like when, you know, they say like when you're feeling down um, or you feel like complaining, like look at somebody who has less than you, right? Um, it really kind of shifts that, that feeling sorry for yourself mm-hmm. um, perspective. And, um, and yeah, they just... Um, you know, the, you see the impact from participating through Sanctuary Kitchen, whether, you know, they're cooking for a dinner or doing a cooking class. Um, so just kind of background, like um, we, we partner with refugee and immigrant chefs and they lead um, pre-COVID, <laughs> we would lead these culinary events. So like cooking classes, um, a supper club and other culinary events in the community with different organizations and businesses. Um, and then we also run a catering social enterprise that provides actual regular employment um, for the chefs who are involved and um, professional training and culinary training as well. So um, as you could imagine, like the, in, the benefits are you know, amazing that you, they, you know, they get income, they're able to develop their skill sets, they're able to make connections in the community uh, network. Um, and then they share their food and their culture, which is always a good thing <laughs> for oh, anybody. Yeah. Um, one of the perks of the job is I'm never hungry. There's always like, amazing food <laughs> around. Yeah. Um, but the cultural exchange piece with the local, like longtime residents um, and, and these women is really beautiful to see and the relationships that form. Yeah. Um, And so, you know, it was like that work for me is so important. It's so critical and so necessary. And, you know, besides my children, like it's what got me going, you know, like got me out of bed, dressed and, you know, ready to do what needed to be done. So um, it's really been um, a lifeline for me. If I didn't have that work that I was so passionate about and, I think it would have been so much more hard for me to get through. Um, Yeah. That that happened, yeah. And, you know, what I was interested in was if we wanted to do something like this. And, you know, we have bits and pieces of what Sanctuary Kitchen's doing around the country, but that model that y'all have, I was actually looking for a toolkit on the Sanctuary Kitchen website. Like, is there a toolkit to these are the people that you talk to or the agencies that you talk to in your state to get something like this going because yeah 
you know, getting them trained, the food handlers, licenses, the commercial kitchens and all of that red tape. And sometimes that's what's holding us back from having right. successful models like that. So do you have anything like that available for other people who might want to do this? Um, not at the moment, but we're working on it. Um, right. We do see Sanctuary Kitchen as a replicable model that can, you know, have branches like around the country. And that's something that we're like exploring right now. The first you know, two years, now we're just into our third year. Um, we're really focused on on fine tuning the programming and really getting it, um, you know, making it sustainable and, um, you know, focusing on the work. Because initially we started doing a lot of different things and mm -hmm. um, because that support was so great in, in New Haven and then also based on what the chefs that we work with, what they wanted to see happen. Um, so we tried to like take on a lot in the beginning and then, um, we grew very fast, um, almost too fast. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so that second year was about like reining back and really tightening our mission and, and our goals and, and having our programming reflect that. Um, so now we're <laughs> again, pre COVID, we were actually like talking about, um, starting to branch out even within Connecticut into different cities. Um, but now with COVID, everything is just like, you know, right. all our programming is based on people coming together, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> In person over food. Right. Right. Um, so we've had to really pivot um, everything that we are doing. Um, all our events are on hold and we're like moving into like virtual classes and events. Um, and then our catering as well. Like have we've changed to more of like a prepared meal. Mm -hmm online ordering where people can pick up once a week or twice a week, um, pick up their food, um, curbside, um, yeah. versus, so, um, we've had to really kind of shift things and think about, okay, moving forward. Cause likely this is going to continue for at least a year, probably right. longer. And what can we do to still fulfill our mission? Um, keep the chefs that we work with still employed, um, and, and how do we make it sustainable? Like, how can we generate enough revenue to keep them employed and, and paid? Because they this is their livelihood that they're relying on. Mm -hmm. So I hope um, in the very near future that we can have these um, toolkits. Because everything now that we, what I would have shared with you, um, you know, to start something is totally Absolutely. different now. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, so in the meantime, paradigm, how can we like support it. Sanctuary Kitchen? Yeah, um, there's a lot of ways. I mean, uh, if you're not local and you can't buy the food, um, you know, you can tune in when we do virtual events and, and participate that way. Um, if there are skill sets that you feel that you can offer even remotely, like um, design or um, grant writing, um, you know, marketing type stuff, uh, website uh, work, um, we would gladly um, take that. Um, translation work can also happen remotely um, or interpretation. Uh, most of our chefs speak either Arabic or Farsi, um, some Swahili. Um, so we're always like have needs for interpretation and translation work. Um, and then lastly, um, financial support. Like if you um, are able to donate or if you know other people or organizations who have grants, or other ways of financially supporting that's the most needed. Uh, we are a small nonprofit, um, our catering program. Um, we were close to break even before uh, COVID hit and now that has set us back uh, mm -hmm. significantly. Um, so um, finances are, are pretty tight. Yeah, absolutely. So where can um, listeners find Sanctuary Kitchen online? Yeah, um, you can check us out on our website, um, sanctuarykitchen.org, um, but more actively on Facebook, um, as well as Instagram, um, Sanctuary Kitchen CT on Instagram. Um, you can get to know our chefs that way. We post their stories and their food, their beautiful food um, regularly, as well as our menus and any events that we're, we're hosting. And I will continue to check your Instagram anytime I want to look at beautiful food and salivate. And, you know, I did actually look up a couple of the recipes that you linked because I was like, okay, I'm going to try to make it. But I have a son who wants to be a chef. So he was like, I mean, I'll make it. You just pull up the recipe for me. So I'm like, 
I think I've got this in the bag. So with your inspiration and his perspiration, I think I'll get fed. <laughs> That'll be awesome. So thank you so much for joining us today. I don't know if you have any final thoughts or anything that you wanted to say before we tune out. Um, not really. I mean, we, we covered a lot and, um, I hope that my story is, is helpful for other people who are going through something similar. Um, you know, keep an eye out for, um, some type of maybe virtual support group that we will hopefully get out there soon, um, for Muslims who are in our situation. Um, but yeah, just, you know, uh, just be mindful about, you know, friends who are, might be going through it and um, don't say those things that we talked about. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we should probably have like something yeah. in our files on Facebook, like things not to say to grieving people. Um, yeah. I mean, if you Google it, there's some really good, good tips out there yeah, too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and if there's anything Mommy Well Muslim can do to help you in creating this uh, grief support group for Muslims, we would be like, we're yours. Where, as you. you say, as in Urdu Hazar, like we're ready um, for anything that you have to offer and we'll help you in whatever way we can. So, Thank you so much for having me on and, you know, helping me share my story. This is the first time I've really done anything like this. So right, right. I survived. <laughs> yes, you did. Thank you for being so vulnerable and so transparent. I absolutely love you for it. Thank you so much.